folks. It's your friendly neighborhood 7th here, and I'm back for another Redneck Retro Review. Today we're going to take a look at one of my all-time favorite games of the 16-bit era, Gunstar Heroes from Treasure. So let's take a look and see what we see. Hundreds of years ago, the Earth was in the midst of war. An evil organization developed a super android called Gold and Silver. Now there's a fucking porn name if I ever heard one. To destroy enemy cities from its base on the moon. Opposing it were the Gunstar Heroes, a team of four highly trained super soldiers who fit into the general mold of the team of kung fu fighting superheroes who wear multicolored uniforms that's been a part of Japanese pop culture since the 70s. They defeat Gold and Silver, remove the four gems that give him his power, and then place themselves in hypersleep on the moon, so that if Gold and Silver should ever escape, they would be there to stop him. Well, all but one of them. Gunstar Green remains awake, and over the centuries forgets who he is and what his original mission was. So you flash forward a few hundred years later, and a corrupt military leader named M. Bison, uh, Smash Dasaku, hatches a plan to retrieve the four gems and awaken gold and silver. Having lost his memory, Gunstar Green becomes corrupted by Smash and becomes one of his generals. Meanwhile on the moon, Dr. Brown, who acts like Dr. Light from Mega Man but looks like Dr. Arkaville from the original Transformers TV show, awakens the remaining three Gunstars, red, blue, and yellow, to stop Smash from reviving gold and silver. And no, most of what I just described is not explained in the US version of the game, short of in the instruction manual, but this was pretty typical of most non-RPG games back then. Gunstar Heroes is a simultaneous two-player action game that combines elements of Contra, Mega Man, and other staples of the 8 and 16-bit generations. Despite the fact that the Genesis 6-button controller was available at the time of the game's release, it sticks to a three-button control scheme. One button fires, but will also grab enemies and throw them if you're close enough. One button switches between weapons, and the jump button also acts as your slide button, flipping up or down off of platforms, and so on. The weapon system is somewhat unique, a combination of the selectable weapon systems from games like Mega Man with the combination abilities of various side-scrolling shoot-em-up. When the game starts, you can choose two out of the three weapons to carry with you, along with the option of free shot or fixed shot. With free shot, the weapon fires in whatever direction you're pressing at the time, and with fixed, you have to manually set which direction you're firing, and then it will stay in that last direction selected until you change it. I've always used free shot myself. The weapon select button during gameplay toggles between these two weapons, with the third option being to combine the powers of the two. For instance, if you choose the flamethrower and the green particle beam, which has a homing beam capability, you'll get a weapon that shoots balls of fire that home in on enemies wherever they are on the screen. If you choose the same weapon for both your weapon slots, then combining them simply creates a more powerful version of that weapon. The downside to this system is that various weapon power-ups are dropped during the game, which land on the ground and don't disappear until you walk far enough from them to pass off screen. Because the game uses the same buttons for multiple functions, it can be somewhat easy to accidentally pick up a weapon you didn't want, and you don't get to reselect your weapon loadout when the next level starts. You have to wait until the weapon you want is dropped again, then set your active weapon to the one you don't want, then stand over the weapon you do want and press down plus attack. This can be harder than it sounds when surrounded by enemies all trying to kick your ass. The level structure is somewhat similar to Mega Man in that you can choose the order in which you tackle the missions. However, there's no real tactical advantage to doing this as you don't earn weapons from the bosses you defeat, so it's somewhat pointless. You have a life meter that counts down to zero and then you have to choose to continue. The harder difficulty you play on, the fewer continues you get. Fairly standard stuff for that era, and far more challenging than the unlimited continues we see in most current gen titles today. While the game is still fun playing solo, its real bread and butter is the two player mode, which can sometimes feel like barely controlled fucking chaos. I can think of no other game on the Genesis that I had more fun griefing the other player. 
is you have the ability to grab him or her just like an enemy and toss them off a cliff. It doesn't kill them, but it's fun as hell if, for example, you both want a particular power-up that just hit the ground and uh, you're just fighting and throwing each other off cliffs trying to get to it first. It also adds another layer of strategy to boss fights, as most of the bosses only seem to be able to focus their weaponry on one target at a time. So you have the ability to alternate between being the decoy and blasting the shit out of the boss while it's distracted by the other player. The music is great and really sets the mood for this type of game, but it doesn't really have any tunes that you'll still be humming after playing it, such as you would experience with the Mega Man series. The graphics are nothing short of stunning, considering that this is on the Genesis, which natively could only handle 64 colors on screen. Thanks to the Wizards at Treasure, you see a wealth of color and effects that simply weren't possible in the early days of the console, including Mode 7 style scaling effects and other bells and whistles. All told, it's one of the best looking Genesis games out there, especially when it comes to the boss fights. You will see bosses in this game that are unlike anything else you've seen on the Genesis, bar none. The levels scroll both horizontally and vertically and keep things varied to avoid becoming too repetitive. One level traps you in a sort of virtual reality board game where you have to roll the dice to get to the final boss. You can easily get stuck on this level alone for almost an hour, depending on where you land on the board. This can be pretty frustrating when you make it to the end, only to land one box short of the final boss, which instead takes you back to the beginning of the damn game board. Finally, after much fighting, you reach Smash's base, only to find that he's kidnapped Gunstar Yellow. You're forced to give him the four gems you spent the last hour or so recovering. But then before he can escape with both the gems and his prisoner, a bunch of little smurf-like creatures come out and untie the ropes and then chase him off screen. What the fuck? Oh. Oh, oh wait a minute. Oh, shit. That, that village I destroyed on the first level. Surely that wasn't... bad guys. <clears throat> Moving on. The next level has you on a spaceship chasing Smash on his way to the moon. This level plays like a side scroll and shoot him up but forces you to use the fixed shot mechanic. So you have to press in the direction you want to shoot and hit the fire button and the direction of fire stays that way until you change it again. With enemies and asteroids coming at you from multiple directions this can be a bit frustrating especially on higher difficulties. Still, it's a fun level that reminds me of one of the last ones in Thunder Force 3, and that's never a bad thing. Finally, you have to fight your way to the control room while all the bosses watch you on the screen, each disappearing one by one as it becomes their turn to die by your hand. You reach the end and must battle the mighty Golden Silver himself, which looks like Dot Matrix from Spaceballs. Yeah. The trick here is to avoid his fire while shooting the four gems hovering around him. Finish him off and you're treated to the ending, where Gunstar Green finally comes to his fucking senses and sacrifices himself to save the Earth. While I think the game would have benefited from the six-button Genesis controller, it's still overall one of the best two-player action games of the 16-bit generation. The only real negative thing I can say about it is that the only sequel ever released was a somewhat less than faithful sequel released on the Game Boy Advance of all things. If there's any action game from the 8 and 16-bit era that I'd like to see given the Bionic Commando rearm treatment, it's definitely Gunstar Heroes. And since it didn't sell very well, but has since attained nothing less of classic cult status, it's a perfect example of how unit sales have nothing to do with whether or not the game is good. Gunstar Heroes came out relatively late in the Genesis life cycle, so there's a lot of people that didn't get to experience this one. Well, you have no excuses. It's on Xbox Live Arcade, it's on the PSN, and it's on the Virtual Console. So if you don't have a Genesis, but you do have one of those, and you have access to the internet, you've got no excuse. Go buy this game. This is set.